Welcome to Thomas and Mary Numumaran's studio and summer cottage. They called it The Studio, capital T, capital S, and it was the first purposeful built studio for an artist on the east end of Long Island, and it was built in 1884 right here in the village of East Hampton, overlooking Town Pond and the Village Green, so it's a really beautiful location. The Morans first came out here in the late 1870s when a friend of theirs, an artist, had invited them out to see Montauk. He said, you've really got to see Montauk. So Mary Nimmo Moran, who was an artist as well, um, both of them came out from New Jersey, uh, took a look, fell in love with Montauk, but really fell in love with East Hampton. The village, its charm, the old houses. So in 1883, after renting houses out here for several summers, they decided this, this would be their permanent summer residence. And so they acquired a three quarters of a lot on Main Street from a Dr. Osborne uh, for $1,500 in November. And then in September uh, 30th of 1884, the year after they bought the property, uh, the whole building was finished, it was all furnished, and they invited their friends to come in and you know, christen their new studio. Now, Pretty obviously, Thomas Moran must have been doing pretty well as an artist, or he wouldn't have been able to build a studio in the first place. And that's a bit of a backstory because Moran was, by the 1880s, one of the wealthier artists in America, and it all fell on some serendipity of his working on some drawings done by an engineer who, in the 1860s, had gone on an early expedition uh, to Yellowstone and had done some scratchy drawings. Uh, somebody else that was on that expedition had written an article which was going to be printed in Scribner's, and this was a magazine that Thomas Moran was doing illustration work for. A lot of artists in the 19th century, particularly after the Civil War, were easily able to supply extra income from not or selling easel work to you know doing illustrations. It was not considered something that was unartistic, the concept of fine art and commercial art hardly existed, and most every artist was doing illustrations. And these scratchy drawings, when Moran got them, just opened up his whole eyes and his imagination. Here were geysers and great canyons and waterfalls. And he looked at these, <clears throat> and he probably wondered why he'd never heard of Yellowstone before. And he also probably wondered, had any other artists or any photographers gone to Yellowstone? And do people know much about this? And in reality, this article was one of the first articles that was printed that really let people know of the wonders of Yellowstone. So Moran worked very quickly to get himself invited on the Hayden Expedition of 1871 um, by this time, he was living in uh, New Jersey, and he had a wife and two children. His wife, Mary Nimmo, uh, he had instructed as his uh, office person, not office person, but really studio helper, and quickly realized that she was very talented and could do a lot more than just do some scratches on some drawings to get them ready for illustration. So. He leaves her for a couple months, goes out west, joins the expedition, <clears throat> is enthralled with what he sees, does lots of sketches, uh, lots of watercolors, some very finished, some not so finished, gets ready to come back home to New Jersey, go to the studio and do a huge painting of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And this will be the first huge painting, really the first painting that any of the public will have ever seen of the wonders of Yellowstone. So he finishes that work, rents a hall in New York City, which was typical of artists during that period, because American artists didn't have a lot of representation with galleries. It was mostly European artists. So he rents this room. Some important people see this painting. A lot of important people see the painting. But in this instance, some people who had been working to try to get 
the government to acquire some of the great national wonders of the American landscape, all of which were ready to be developed um, for mining or hotels or whatever, and they were fearful that these amazing national wonders would be lost. And every time they would go to Congress, Congress didn't seem to have very much interest in buying, obtaining, or preserving, or whatever, these national landmarks. So this giant painting uh, was borrowed from Mr. Moran, sent to Washington, D.C., where it gets displayed at the Capitol. Um, it is awe-inspiring, there's no question about it. The canyon, the, the storm in the distance, the, the scale of the painting. And so it does begin, it is in fact the major catalyst to the resolution to create the first national park, which in fact is Yellowstone. The painting is sold to the federal government for $10,000, and this was in the 1870s and it, we were still in recession after the Civil War, which had been a blight on, to the ego and the wealth and a number of, of assets and, and perceptions of America. So Moran becomes famous. He's in stereoptican views of other expeditions that he's going to go on. His illustrations, his chromolithographs, the, the stereoptican views, the paintings, he sells another one a few years later to the federal government. So by the time he does get invited out here, he's a wealthy, respected world traveler, and his wife is one of the most important etchers uh, in America at the time. So the studio was his conception, he designed it. Uh, he made this giant room, uh, two stories with huge plate glass windows that were rescued from old buildings that were being torn down in their neighborhood because they had recently moved to New York City and moved to the Chelsea neighborhood where a lot of buildings were being demolished. So he took newel posts and fireplace mantles and all these things and created an enormous assemblage, almost like his, his first sculpture, with unusual window treatment, um, odd and various periods of, of architectural elements and these huge commercial plate glass windows. It became a center here, really the probably the founding center nucleus for the art colony that became called the American uh, Byzantium. And uh, this was the center. Uh, many, many artists came here to visit. The Morans and their three kids were very open and very friendly. And the exhibit that we have on this year at the studio uh, is about three of the Morans, Edward, Thomas, and Mary Nemo Moran. Edward as Thomas's brother, who was an artist and was Thomas's teacher. Thomas, who was taught by his brother Edward, taught his wife Mary Nemo to be an artist, to draw and paint. And of course, Mary Nemo Moran, who almost gave up painting, although towards the end of her life, she painted some beautiful paintings of her garden, but she really devoted herself to the art of etching, which was very, very popular in the United States in the 1880s. So we're gonna look at a couple works by these artists. Um, so you can become familiar with what they were doing and why they were so popular and why today uh, we look at Thomas Moran and Mary Nemo Moran as really major artists in the whole landscape of the history of art. So here we're looking at a really amazing painting by Thomas Moran, done in 1894. And it's a painting of probably Main Beach out here in East Hampton, which is just a few uh, just a mild walk down the street for the Morans from their studio cottage. And this shows you the power of sort of narrative that uh, Moran is able to achieve with using a number of different techniques. Um, we have some uh, palette knife work down here to sort of give us that, that look of, of of recently receding water from the, from the beach. You've got the, the sunlight, this bright sunlight, the little touches of sailboats in the distance. 
He gets the effect of wind blowing by showing that red flag there, and that red flag really is an important element. Um, people are gathered around the little area there, which is probably in some of the old photographs, there's a little boat there with uh, sand in it, so possibly for kids to play. There's people, and in the distance here, you can see the little uh, buildings that would be brought down in the summertime from the estates, and those were bathhouses, and here at the Moran Studio, we have one of the original bathhouses. But look at the blues, and look at the brushwork. You know, there's impasto for the clouds, and the whole sense of sort of movement here that you get by having the red over here and then going to the brightness of the white of the cloud and then sort of keeping us moving around the canvas. And of course, that's an important element of what artists in the 19th century and, and realistic artists today do. They construct, they make a, a composition that is controlled so our eye goes through it. It's just not, you know, it's not looking at something and copying it. It's taking what you see and creating something that is a living, breathing, and quite extraordinary, bright and, and sunlit beach scene. Now, Edward Moran, Thomas's older brother, had studied with an artist by the name of Hamilton at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, who was a maritime painter. And it seems that Moran was so influenced by his teacher that he remained an artist of the sea for his entire life. And this painting, which was done around 1875, is in New York Harbor. And it's a scene that looks as though it might be early morning or it might be a, a later on or a gray day. There may be a little storm coming in. The waves, the splashing in pasto once again that the artist uses. Um, he's a master of rigging, so uh, with just a few lines with, from his brush, he's able to achieve you know, a fully rigged uh, three-masted ship, which is almost coming towards us. Here in the foreground, on the right-hand side, you've got uh, some fishermen in, in their small little boat there, and looks like the wake from the big one might be a little troublesome for these guys over here. And notice the red. <clears throat> and notice how we're over here on the right-hand side of the canvas. So we, we sort of come into the red. The artist controls our eyes. We go to the red. We then go up this diagonal, which was developed during the Baroque period as a theme of, of creating energy in a composition. Just imagine if the boat were flat, straight up, but no, the wind is blowing, sails are blowing out, you can see how he accents it. Red flag up here, so we go up to the red flag there. And he doesn't want us to stop there. He brings us down to the buoy over here in the corner. So he creates a triangle of composition so we're always looking. We're looking here, we're looking at the boats in the distance. Uh, here are the smaller boats. We come back here, you can sort of follow that gray line from the cloud, and we can see the silhouettes of the boats here, and then we go back, so we go back and forth. So the construction is as important as the elements and how the design is done. I mean, he's a wonderful draftsman, as was his brother Thomas. Um, but when it comes to painting, he manipulates paint beautifully. And when you look closely, some of the sea areas almost look non-objective because he, it's a painting that you see all of the details of the paint, then you stand back and all of a sudden you see the picture. We're here in the small gallery at the Thomas Moran studio. And we're looking at an etching by Mary Nimmo Moran. And this is a middle size uh, etching. She did full plates, half plates, and quarter plates. And this is a half plate etching, so it's larger than usual. It's a Georgia Capon. And it is really a spectacular example of her work. Uh, unlike her husband, who was trained to do drawings outside and watercolors and then do the finished product in the studio, he did the same thing with his etchings. He would do drawings out in the real world, bring them in, and then he'd sit at his drafting table in the studio and etch the plate. 
She often would take the plate outside with her, a technique that the French call en plein air, and she would do the etching plate directly there, then come in and go through all of the mechanisms of acid, bath, and that to create the print, which would then be, then be printed up. So there's lots of beautiful details here, but there's also a lot of open space, um, beautiful areas. You know, here at Georgica, we can see the Kennedy uh, Cottage, which is still there in the, in the Georgica colony. And you can look at the sort of stunted trees, and you can look at this little pathway that was used by the Osbournes to get their cattle across uh, Georgica Pond. There was a uh, steamboat in the distance, uh, the little, little windmill there for pumping water, uh, the clouds which are accented with, with a lighter, lighter ink, and then the reflective quality here of the pool. All of this is done with these beautiful little lines uh, to create this sort of overall almost embroidery in some ways because it all looks like little threads. But she was able to look at a landscape and then give us the essence of the landscape without losing us in thousands of details. And it's, this is one of the masterpieces and this is one of the reasons that Mary Nimmo today is considered to be one of the greatest etchers that America's produced.